Creative Question Challenge. The Creative Question Challenge is a new brainstorming format in which speakers explore and present creative questions in a 30 minute, minute dialogue. We would like to invite audience members to submit their questions as comments in the YouTube stream throughout uh, our whole dialogue as uh, they will be pick, picked up uh, towards the end of the conversation. This talk uh, takes place in the frame of Studiotopia, an European initiative that invites scientists and artists to work together over a 17 month um, journey. Uh, and that journey starts today. My name is Corina Bucha. I am a cultural manager working with Cluj Cultural Center, which is one of the Studiotopia partners. Today in the talk, let me introduce Alexandra Piric. Uh, who is an artist with a background in dance and choreography, who works undisciplined across different media. Her works have been exhibit exhibited, among others, at Skulturberg de Münster 2017, uh, Venice Biennial, uh, Tate Modern London, New Museum New York, or Manifesta 10. Also in the talk, we have Paco Calvo, who is a professor of philosophy of science and uh, principal investigator at Minimal Intelligence Lab at the University of Murcia, Spain. His research interests range broadly within cognitive sciences with a special emphasis on ecological psychology, embodied cognitive science and plant intelligence. The question we will be starting our conversation with is what can we as scientists, artists, uh, human beings learn from plants? So I would invite Alexandra and Paco to uh, answer this question and to give us um, their reflection on this idea. Should I start first? <laughs> um, I mean, uh, I think it's interesting. I, I think we're all human beings and we should all be to a certain extent uh, artists and scientists as well. So I'm trying to, to think, I think what we need to do is also do away with this very strong division of labor in general and division of knowledge in society. So um, I think we should learn from plants collectively as both scientists and artists. Um, and I guess um, from my point of view, I was uh, very much interested in time scale in the fact that plants work with a different time scale. Um, and it's, it's something that I think humans also need, really desperately need to learn to do, to, uh, to attune to a different time scale. And I'm also interested in their movement, in the different speed and different rhythm of movement uh, when it comes to plants. And the fact that actually they move quite a lot and they do quite a lot and they're, they're very intelligent. It's just that we're not really, uh, let's say, able to pay attention and we're not sensible enough or we're not used to, to attuning to this kind of rhythm and to, uh, I wouldn't say slowness, but to a, a, different, a, a different rhythm and a different speed of movement. And again, I think on a political level, this this is what we actually need to do uh, for the future and as, as, as a human society. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I couldn't agree more with, uh, with Alessandra. In a sense, well, you know, my background, I'm a philosopher of cognitive science. So I'm used to dealing with, I study plant intelligence and I have to talk to people in the sciences, to philosophers, to people in the humanities, in the arts. And, and it's true that we somehow um, can learn something collectively. Um, but at the same time, even if, even if we were not that making that collective uh, effort, take just biologists. I mean, if you're a biologist, the short answer is that everything, you can learn everything from them. If you're a scientist in general, uh, the first thing you can learn is uh, to eat humble pie. So that's a, I'm not a native English speaker, but maybe you get the idea, right? So to eat humble pie, we are talking about being more modest and realizing as a biologist, if you look at the tree of life, to realize that we are just this little tiny branch at the end of the tree of life, and we are not that special. And we need to say this in loud voice many times to realize that we are not that special, right? So we are just yet just one more way of solving problems in nature, right? One other type of organism. And if we are not able to appreciate plant intelligence, it's because we are actually 
not truly understanding that we are not that special. We are not the pinnacle of anything. We are not at the top of anything, right? Um, now, if you are able to do that, just forget about sciences and arts, just as human beings, just as a human being, someone lay people in the street. So even for anyone at home, what we can all learn is to empathize in a different way. So even when we think about our fellow humans, uh, friends or whatever, or other animals, so if we are truly wide open in the scope of, of the appreciation of intelligence in organisms, think about it, organisms that don't even have neurons. So if you have a form of life that is successfully behaving, so they are passing their genes, there must be something that they are doing that is damn right. They are passing their genes. They didn't go extinct. So in the tree of life, there are many different solutions to the problems that we all uh, face every day, right? And then once you understand that you don't even need neurons to solve those problems, plants don't have neurons and they are here and they are doing great. So then we can say, hey, it's true. We are not that special in that very sense. You don't even need to have a brain to do well in life, right? So if once you appreciate that, then what we learn or we should be able to learn with a little bit of effort is to put ourselves in the shoes of other beings, be it human animals, other animals, other species, and even from other kingdoms like plants. So that's a way to develop our capacity to empathize with other forms of life. And it requires education, it requires training, it requires a lot of mental effort, but, but I think that the, the outcome is, is terrific, is that we truly are able to put ourselves in the shoes of other people and other species. Yeah. Um. Alexander, yeah. Would, would uh, yeah. I mean, again, I, I I agree completely, and I think this question of, of of modesty is actually super important because it is about. I mean, again, we're at a point if we follow on the discussions on the Anthropocene, where it, we really have to rethink how we act in the world, and the question of modesty also brings about, I think, the notion of care and of being careful and trying to also become more aware but and more sensitive. To to uh, to other ways of being in the world, from which uh, yeah, from I, uh, it's it's nice what Paco said that you can actually learn everything uh, um, from other life forms. For me, I guess also when it comes to empathy, and, and again, I want to to also say something that um, to a certain extent, um, I do think that plants will be fine, even if if humans go extinct, right? So plants, they will they they will be fine. Definitely. So I'm also more interested in what what is it, what it is that humans can what it is that, that we do actually. Um, um, and and it, it's always a question of politics and a question of sensibility, I think. So I think uh, most of the problems we're facing today, they're not economic. They are not even, uh, I mean, they are of course climate related, but how you respond to that, you know, how what response you're able to provide has necessarily to do with how you frame the question. What is the question? It's a bit like oh, in Ursula Le Guin's uh, left hand of darkness, it makes no sense to obtain answers to the wrong questions, yeah. right? And I think we're still at this point where we're asking very wrong questions. And even sometimes when, even when we speak about sustainability, I would like to know what is it that we're trying to sustain here? Hmm. What kind of society, what kind of life also? That, Alexandra, that's a great point because if you think about uh, in environmental sciences, even the very word resource, when we talk about resources, the very, that's, that means everything because just by labeling them resources, it means that we only care about them insofar as they are useful to us. So of we course. talk about the exploitation of resources. Yes. And we need to drop, we need to drop that terminology. Yeah. And you have people in university, in environmental sciences, in the biological sciences, being taught that we should care for the world, for the, for the planet, because it's a resource for us to exploit. And they just discuss which way to exploit it. Mm, exactly. Whether we do it in a sustainable way or not. Mm -hmm. And think that when we, when we look at plants as agents, so when we look at plants as subjects, mm -hmm. as creatures, and not as objects, as resources to be exploited, then we can look at them with a whole different eye. We say, hey, it's not about what we can get from them. It's about them in themselves for themselves. Mm -hmm. so, to yeah. prove, so to put yourself in their shoes, 
truly means to think differently, to say, hey, what is it that matters to them? So you mentioned something really interesting about, you just mentioned something about sensitivity and slowness. And slowness. So something else that we can learn is, you know, in this hectic world of fast, fast food, fast science, fast everything, everything is, has got to be fast. We need to chill out, to slow down, to sit back and relax. Mm -hmm. Once we do that, then we can converge in that time scale Alexandra was mentioning. Then mm -hmm. you can truly start to appreciate things to say, hey, take it easy. We, here in, in my lab, what we do is we take uh, time-lapse pictures. So we take pictures, assemble the footage, and then watch the time-lapse. And watching the time-lapse of, of a plant behaving in the real time, when, when you, once you watch it, you realize how much you were missing. But not about the actual way they move or they grow, because you could still appreciate their movement or their growth and still be talking about resources. No, it's about that you can only, by looking at them at their own time scale, you can only, by doing that, appreciate what is it that matters to them. What do they care about? Not what we care about, but what is it that is important to them as agents, right? Mm -hmm. Another way to put it is, sorry, is sustainability to say, well, uh, 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 to care about sustainability is something we should do, as you said, even if we were not on planet Earth, for their plan's own sake. That's to treat them as subjects and not as objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, what I, I just wanted to, to maybe uh, add something to that, because the same way in which you look at plants, I think we also look uh, not only at the nature around us, let's say, as a resource, but of course, we look at humans as resources. And we have, you know, HR departments, the human resource department is, you know, it, um, it has yeah. uh, already like, yeah. been there for ages. So I think we should also look at each other differently, not as something to exploit for the sake of productivity for what. Um, and then I, I also um, I'm kind of um, skeptical about using slowness also because I think language is also so much imbued with meaning and connoted in different ways. I feel mm -hmm. like again we came to associate slowness with something that uh, is not Pro, pro, you know, it doesn't produce enough progress. It's not uh, dynamic. If you think about the, the, the language in technology, there's always uh, about disruption, you know, moving fast and breaking things, right? It's, this is so <laughs> stupid. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just, <laughs> uh, right? So I, I think, think about different speeds and different rhythm. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just yeah. different. Yeah. It's not slow. It's not, it's slow in relation to something, right? Slow, slow yeah. is also just a relational. So uh, different, description. So different is the key. That's the key word because it's not a matter of, of, of comparing one against the other. So that happens with plants with respect to animals. So one of the things I love about Darwin, if you go back to Darwin and to, mm -hmm. to the you know the, the botanist the, the botany of the 19th century, is that uh, uh, they couldn't regard botany as subordinate to zoology. And that's mm -hmm. pretty much what we mean to say when we say, or when you said at the beginning, that we shouldn't regard the arts as subordinate to the sciences. So in the very same way, so it's, you don't compare them. There is not a shared metric. And then you compare them and one put, land it on the metric and compare it against each other. It's just different uh, rules of the game and you are playing different games. You just mm -hmm. need to understand it in itself for its own value. Mm -hmm. right not against the other so it's, it's, it's great yeah. to put it in terms of the time scale so no nothing is a slow or fast it's the right velocity for the type of ends it has mm -hmm. yeah. So. yeah for sure yes <laughs> do you want to uh, introduce um, something else Corina? yeah um i wanted to to remind the audience that you can uh, post also questions in the in the youtube stream um, in the way. this is our cue to tell us that we are um, in the middle of our conversation, so we still have um, uh, time to pick up on your questions. Um, otherwise, um, I wanted to um, uh, come back a bit to towards um, what Alexandra was mentioning uh, at the beginning, that and what you also continued uh, uh, reflecting on here, that there is um, that we shouldn't um, look. Um, at plants or pretty much any any subject of our observation and reflection from this uh, very from a, a point of view of a strong division uh, of uh, labor and knowledge, which also you continued on um, in the conversation as uh, more of a reflection of uh, 
hier hierarchical um, meanings that we sometimes give between between arts and science. So I was thinking how um, and and also also reflecting on um, uh, the fact that actually although you are coming from different standpoints in a traditional way an artistic one and a scientific one you both used words uh, which of course also reflect on um, uh, interests that are much softer than what we are used to have as as this di uh, division i mean um uh, Paco, you you were talking about you mentioned words like care, uh, empathy. Um, Alexandra, you were talking about knowledge. So this um, shift or switch, let's say, between uh, hard hard terminology and softer terminology, is this a place of meeting and a place of uh, let's say cross contamination between arts and science? Um, does a subject does a subject like plant intelligence bring you together easier, or where is this place of uh, of of meeting between mm -hmm. arts and science in this topic? Yeah, maybe you, maybe you want to start this time, Paco. So that we yeah, yeah. We, yeah well, I, I guess uh, Alexandra and I we've we've talked before about all this, and and I think there is a a key word here, which is movement. Uh, Movement is, is just perfect because think we said plants don't have neurons. Actually, many people, many people think that plants are stupid. I have a colleague, a fellow philosopher, who says plants can afford to be stupid because they are rooted. And being rooted, they take life as it comes. They do photosynthesis. They don't need to go shopping to go for food. They can be rooted so they can afford to be stupid. And it's the other way around. Just, just turn it the other way around and say, no, no. How smart, how intelligent they've got to be to keep passing their genes despite being rooted. And when you think, when you make the intellectual effort to see how they do their living, then you realize that being rooted doesn't mean not moving. So they move, they grow, they develop, they reach the places they need to reach. So they grow roots to find the patch of nutrients. They grow their branches and tendrils to reach and do photosynthesis. So they are moving, but moving takes the form of growth and development. So when I think of the way artists, I mean, in dance and choreography, think about it, it's just perfect. Because in science, we have this car cartoon understanding of science, like we are simply testing hypotheses. But it makes no sense to test a hypothesis if you don't have a good idea in the first place. So only with good ideas, you get to put those ideas into empirical hypothesis that then you can take to the lab and test. And from Alexandra, what I get is plenty of inspiration to get new ideas. So to truly think different, to think of different ways and that then you can think hard of how to frame that question, that problem in a, in a, in a, in a way that you can take to the lab and test it. But movement is the perfect example because if plants don't have neurons, if we don't need to think what's going on in here, there is not the brain, there is not the nervous central system. So if it's not about that, if it's not about information processing in the head of the plant, as we think is the, is the case in humans, then maybe it's also true that human intelligence, our own intelligence, is not about doing things in our head. It's about interacting with our surroundings. So we, when we are moving, interacting with our, with our surroundings in a social environment, and that's something, think of collective intelligence, a school of fish, a swarm of birds, you know, like collective a, a flock of birds. So in those cases, it's clear that the solution to the problem cannot be in the head of the individual. It's in the collectivity. So in a lot of creations of, in a lot of works of art, that's the type of inspiration that allows you to think, hey, how can we reframe those questions to go to the lab and test those ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we, uh, because we, 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 uh, we talked about many things before and we came also to this concept of energy flows and we were speaking about Tai Chi and yeah. again, movement. So, and, and, and embodied perception or the inactive approach to perception, which is, I, I feel like it's still not very well rooted into new cognitive sciences. Also understanding again, mm -hmm. that we are thinking with our whole body actually. Um, and I also just wanted to say something maybe about being rooted because I think, 
However, we like to think of ourselves as being mobile. In the end, if we think at a global scale, we are also rooted. Uh, and I feel like all these toxic fictions of escaping the earth, you know, there's so much money and resources being put into this fantasy of escape where you just go and colonize Mars. And we, we didn't manage, we are destroying a planet that has all the, the, uh, the conditions for life. Right. So again, the question is not a technological, a scientific one. It is a political and a question of sensibility and of who, what is the position from which we develop also technologies and extensions of ourselves. And I think that we need to work on ourselves a lot. But uh, it, again, in a question That's of politics, <laughs> and, and we're very much rooted. We are just like plants. And in a way, this is also very interesting, uh, I think, to, to understand that we also have to solve problems while understanding that we cannot run away there's nowhere to run away to what we you know <laughs> of course we are more mobile but as a metaphor i think we're very much uh yeah we're just as as rooted as uh, as plants um i also wanted to maybe um i'm trying i'm really trying to to think about what it means what what exactly does it mean to be an in, to make an intellectual effort um because this is also somehow, so this distinction between let's say physical labor or intellectual labor is also predicated, I think, upon a, du a dualist view of the world and, and understanding things as discrete, uh, well enclosed territories and parts. Uh, whereas in fact, there's always relation, that everything is always connected and, and more, uh, more entangled than we like to think. Um, and of course, because I, I come from, uh, from dance and choreography, but I also don't, let's say, I don't try to romanticize a certain part of, of, of movement practice that does not favor reflection. So where just because you move, you think, of course you, you think, but what kind of thinking you do is also important. So I, but I think we do physical and intellectual labor when we read a book and when we train or when we do a Tai Chi exercise or when we dance. So it's both things at the same time. It's just that they may be different. They're, they're, yeah, they have different, also different purposes. But this is also why I feel like when we approach plants, there is always, there has to be an embodied, or there is always an embodied approach to, to different life forms. And it has also to do, I think, with uh, even uh, stop, to stop privileging a certain bipedic, uh, this, is, this is the word, you know, like yeah. being on two legs, it's great yeah. to be on two legs. This is the yeah. pinnacle of evolution, right? So sometimes it's good that you go on the ground at the ground level and you maybe you spend time, let's say on the ground and looking at things from, from closer, not from a distance or, which of course also what I guess you do in the lab when you think about mm, uh, yeah, Im different imaging processes that allow you to zoom in. But I think you get a different understanding when your body is also involved in, and positions itself in different configurations. Absolutely, absolutely. So actually, uh, you know, one of the fields I work in is ecological psychology. So ecological psychology, which means do psychology ecologically and not computationally. Mm -hmm. Great, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and that's precisely the point. I mean, one of the mottos of this school of thought, uh, you know, someone said this uh, a few decades ago, uh, we are talking in the, in, the, in the late 70s, and he used to say, ask not what's inside the head, but what the head is inside of. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very and, nice. <laughs> and that's, and that's, that's the trick. I mean, because we said, hey, some forms of life may not have evolved neuronal tissue. So yeah, sure, they don't have neurons, but we couldn't possibly say they don't have a body. Mm -hmm. So any organism, any form of life whatsoever needs a body. You couldn't do anything without a body, but you can do things without neurons. So it's yeah. what's, not what's inside the head, but what the head is inside of. And the head is inside a body that is surrounded and interacted in real time. So it's coupled to the surroundings. So we cannot detach it. You cannot detach it and do like what, you know, traditional schools of, of thought say armchair philosophy. Like, you know, you sit in the coach and do all your thinking, you know, compute the answer mm -hmm. and, and, and speak yeah, yeah. it out. I, I mean, you can do it because it is being done, but I think that translates into the thinking. Your po body posture and the fact that you do not move differently translates yes. into the dis discursive knowledge that you yes. produce actually. And of course, it has different repercussions. It, 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 
yeah, it, it reflects a certain understanding of the world where you think you can exactly compute the world yeah. from a sort of, there's also this fiction of still at work of this objective outside, this non-situated perspective. So yeah, uh, this is also something that we need to, to do away with. I mean, we've talked about the relation in between the arts and the sciences and how we can get some reciprocal feedback. And there is something very interesting that I care about. I don't have the answer, but I want to raise the question, which is, which is, it's not that how we can inform each other. So it's not like, what, it is that, what is it that I can get from you and what is it that you can get from me? It's about what is it in the interaction in between the two that couldn't be accomplished otherwise? So to me, that's the critical question. Like, because you might say, hey, oh yeah, that's great because that's just a matter of translation. We do this, you translate it into your format and then you are doing th that stuff. So we can trade with metaphors, but mm -hmm. beyond metaphors, how can we use those metaphors to engage into a different sort of relation? And now we go back to the sustainability issues in development and all that stuff and say, what is it that we could accomplish that we, that?" truly couldn't be done in any other way mm -hmm. rather than by teaming up, right? Mm -hmm. With all these different backgrounds, different schools and different mm -hmm. approaches. So that's the genuine, the genuine added value of the collaboration. Otherwise yeah. it's a matter of translating and that's it. I completely agree. I, I shouldn't try to, to add anything to this. I think it's for, for the development of the, the research. Maybe Corina has uh, some. Yeah, I think, I think that um, um, it's for, for, uh, for our conversation now, it's time to, to wrap up since we are approaching the 30 minute uh, border. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm really happy that uh, Paco launched this uh, question that we will have to leave rhetorical at this moment. But I think it's a, also a great um, invitation somehow and a great uh, starting point for what um, uh, you've already started uh, uh, reflecting on in your collaboration with Studio Topia, but also as a greater reflection on whether we are talking about plants as a subject or uh, pretty much any other field of knowledge. Um, I would just like to, uh, to bring and to emphasize this word knowledge um, that you, you mentioned uh, uh, towards the end of your contributions, because I think it's um, kind of uh, the answer and the opening to other questions when it comes to what can art and science bring together. I think um, this field of knowledge is something that is that you in your individual contributions and in your dialogue have uh, nuanced um, uh, in, in, yeah, in, a, in a very inspiring way um, and uh, have nuanced both in, let's say, terms of, um, um, as, as I emphasized before, of care, of empathy, of ecological uh, type of thinking, where, as uh, Alexander mentioned, we stop privileging being on two legs and look at uh, the environment. But also in the more, let's say, political sense, where we try to bring types of meaning and of knowledge to your meeting. So I would like to thank you both um, for your contributions and um, um, looking forward to see the next talks in uh, uh, Axe Electronica, the Studiotopia Creative uh, Question Challenge. Thank you and have a great day. Yeah, thank you thank as you well. So